Hello, and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. In this week's episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we learn that Earth will soon be visited by an asteroid the size of Manhattan. But don't worry, it's wearing a face mask. Next, we solve the mystery of a missing planet, and we learn how studying oceans on alien worlds would make for a high pressure environment. On April 29th, the Earth will be visited by an asteroid named 1998 OR2. This body, discovered over a decade ago, is now seen in new images coming toward Earth sporting a feature resembling a face mask. A structure on the asteroid which would prove scientifically fascinating under normal conditions now brings to mind images of the familiar facial gear worn by so many people during the current pandemic. But don't worry, the asteroid is also maintaining social distancing and will safely miss our planet by more than 16 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Researchers looking at the exoplanet Fomalhaut B found a surprise. The planet wasn't there. Analysis reveals that what astronomers thought was an alien planet is in fact debris from the collision of a pair of icy bodies in that solar system. Fomalhaut B has always been unusual, being seen in visible light observations, but not by instruments observing the target using infrared wavelengths. More detailed analysis shows the signal, thought to be a planet wrapped in a cloud of ice and dust, is composed entirely of debris from an ancient collision. Giant water worlds may be common throughout the galaxy, but conditions under these alien oceans remains a mystery. A team of researchers from Arizona State University have subjected silica to extreme conditions like those thought to exist under extraterrestrial oceans on massive worlds. This material, along with water, was pressed in a diamond anvil and heated to thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. The process yielded a product the researchers described as a weird amalgamation of silicon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This strange behavior of materials may also be happening far beneath massive oceans on alien worlds, the study suggests. This is a special week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we broadcast our first ever video interview. For this special occasion, we talked with Dr. Stephen Daunt of the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Daunt led a subsurface biospheres team for the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and he led both of the first two drilling expeditions designed to search for life under the ocean floor. A new study from the University of Tokyo suggests his work could have a significant impact in how we search for life on Mars. And welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. So um, you tell us a little bit about how you, uh, you became interested in searching under the, under the surface of the ocean, under uh, the bottom of the ocean for life. People had been intermittently finding evidence of life beneath the seafloor for roughly 30 years before I started. And there was a concerted effort by a lab in England led by John Parks to essentially I'd look for cells in subseafloor sediment and get some sense of their potential and how many there might be. And John and his collaborators were, were making astonishing discoveries. And I thought any field where people can make astonishing discoveries by sending one or two people at sea once in a while is a field where there might be a lot of astonishing discoveries to make. Great. So I moved into that area uh, about 20 years ago now, and one of my first activities was to propose the first drilling expedition to focus expressly on the, uh, the topic of subsurface life as the, the principal uh, focus. And there's a lot 
power in doing that because these drilling expeditions are international collaborations. And essentially we could put 105 people on this project at once, half of them members of the science party. So, so once you dedicate an expedition, you can get a lot of international work done. Mm. And what were you hoping to find on this particular expedition? In that particular expedition, um, we were mainly focused on trying to understand sort of the diversity of organisms and activities and their numbers and how they change from one subseafloor environment to another, uh, particularly in the parts of the ocean where we expected there to be a lot of organisms and uh, where we had a lot of drilling information already. So for, those first two for that first expedition, we focused on the coast of Peru, drilling on the shelf and drilling in the Peru Trench, and focused in the equatorial Pacific. Because these were all places where, where people had identified cells before and we knew we, we could find them and then have an opportunity to see how many were associated with different horizons and what sorts of activities they might be doing. Uh, in the end, how they might affect the world. That's awesome. And what, where did, what did you find? What is life like under the, under the sea floor? What we found from that expedition was that um, microbes are very, very abundant. Um, that where you have uh, essentially zones of concentrated metabolic activity, in this case, sulfate reducing methane oxidation, you get much higher concentrations of cells. So that told us that, there, that the distribution of cells depended on the resources available. And that might not be a surprise to any normal thinking human being, but it's something that had never been checked before. And uh, we found that the number of cells and their rates of activity varied in predictable ways um, from one environment to another as the, avail as the availability of organic matter and oxidants went up and down. Um, yeah. And so this provided us with a, a footing for ultimately figuring out how many cells live in the sediment of the world ocean and what kinds of activities they engage in. One of the things that we found from that particular expedition was that unexpected activities often occur uh, in unexpected places. So for, for a few decades, people had thought there's a specific succession where you go from oxygen using microbes near the seafloor to nitrate and metal using, sulfur using, CO2 using as you go deeper and deeper. And the idea is that the oxidants that generate the most energy are the ones that are used up first. To, to a first approximation, this pattern holds correct. But what we find is when you get into the middle of a sediment column, you sometimes get zones down in the CO2 reducing sediment or the sulfate reducing sediment where iron reduction or manganese reduction, metal reduction starts up again. And then as we get down near the basement, the seawater flowing through the basement reintroduces oxygen and nitrate. Hmm. So activities turn on and off as you move up and down through the column in ways that people would not have predicted before. And those depend partly on the history of sedimentation and partly on how open the underlying basement is to water flow. Hmm. And so whatever, so life forms there, depending on what's abundant, the resources available. That's right. To it, essentially. It's fascinating. And speaking of rare resources, um, recently some researchers at the University of Tokyo um, published a paper showing how um, how this, these concentrations of of uh, primitive life might might be similar to what we could find on Mars? Um, how do you, how do you look at at how this affects the search for life on the Red Planet? Well, that that particular expedition, we went to the deadest part of the ocean, where sediment accumulates so slowly that a million years ago the sediment might just be eight centimeters below the seafloor. And we drilled through that slowly accumulating sediment, which actually had living cells and oxygen at every depth on the way to the basement. And then somewhere between 10 and 70 and 100 meters below the seafloor, depending on the sedimentation rate, we intersected the basement, the hard igneous rock below. And we kept drilling into that to look for further evidence of life. And that's a, that's a tricky problem because in the sediment, we can push a piston ahead of the drill and catch sediment in that. And so collect the sediment without a whole lot of contamination, just like you might 
pick up juice or, or a milkshake with a straw. But when we get to the hard rock below, we've got to grind and grind and grind and wash away the grindings as we go. And so stuff gets really contaminated. And previous expeditions that had worked in that environment had a big, big problem with contamination for that reason. And so the decision that Yohei Suzuki, who's lead on that article, and Fumio Inagaki and I made, Fumio and I co-led the expedition, was we're going to focus looking for life in the mineralized fractures of the rock, where, where the cracks got filled in by minerals growing over the last, depending on the, the location, 10 to 100 million years. So instead of looking for microbes on the surface of the rock or in the water that comes out, we said, let's, let's look in the fractures that were filled by minerals. And so that's what Yohei and his team at the University of Tokyo did. And what they found was that some mineral fillings like calcite, there's no microbes living in them at all. But some other mineral fillings that, that are in the clay family that make up maybe a couple percent of the fracture filling in the rock have as many as a billion cells per uh, cubic centimeter of mineral, which is an extraordinary amount. That's the concentration you expect to see at the seafloor. Now, in some ways, using those units is misleading because we're talking about essentially a biofilm, a film of organisms that is one organism thick. So our cubic centimeter is spread over a very wide distance because each microbe is only a mm -hmm. micron in diameter, one, one thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. But they're cheek by jowl. You know, each microbe is huddled up next to its neighbor going on in this flat interface between the, the alteration mineral and the rock that was altering the form it. Wow. Yeah. Makes me think of a little bit of a living graphene. Yeah, you can think of it as a little bit like a living graphene. And, yeah. and you, you mentioned Mars before, and one uh, very clear relevance for Mars is if, if, if organisms can live in 100-million-year-old basalt, beneath Earth's seafloor in those concentrations, depending on what they're doing for a living, perhaps they could live at those concentrations in, in mineral-filled fractures of Mars as well. Right. But of course, one advantage that um, microbes here on Earth have that may be more difficult for ones on Mars would be liquid water. Um, so is right. there enough liquid water for any concentration of these things to build up and live for billions of years since Mars was once a water world? Right. So this isn't the sort of thing you'd expect to see on the surface of Mars. But, but of course, as you move down beneath the surface, uh, Mars, like Earth, has an internal heat source. It has the radioactive decay that's going on, and the heat from that decay uh, propagates up toward the surface. And then there are other causes of internal heating of planets, you know, like the friction from their motion around the sun and their tugging relative to Jupiter. All of those sources of heat um, make the interior of planets warmer than the surface, as you and your, your audience will know. And so there's some depth below the surface of Mars at which liquid water presumably exists in the fractures. And at that depth, one might uh, see life as, as we saw in, in Yohei's paper. Fabulous. And one last question. Um, is if there were life um, on Mars, you know, hiding in these little little channels, um, it, what experiments or which experiments might rovers or potentially even orbiters carry out in the future that could help find them? Well, one of the things that was very clear um, coming out of Yohei's study was that the mineral association is really, really important. So, so these microbes are growing on uh, fairly specific classes of minerals that I expect would be present on Mars as well on Earth. They're essentially water-altered rock that, that has become clay. And uh, he refers to them in the paper as smectites, um, which is sort of a garbage can term that mineralogists use for a category of poorly ordered clay. Um, so having a way to identify the minerals would allow people to narrow pretty quickly the field in which they, they search. Uh, if you're looking for life like we observed in, in Yohei's study, you wouldn't bother looking at the calcites, the carbonates, maybe the anhydrites, which are the sulfate minerals. You'd go straight for those garbage can clays. 
And so a way to identify them would be very helpful. And then the other thing that, that uh, we see in that paper is the initial technique used to find the material is visual imaging based on dyes that leach into the cells and bind to nucleic acids and then fluoresce. And so some sort of visual technique that also relies on binding of that kind might be very helpful. Um, in a sense, uh, you know, with, with sort of the rovers we have now, the thing that you might look for would be, be samples of old life, right? So they'd have to look for those kinds of mineral associations in, in regions where the, the relationship might have been protected. And then a really exciting possibility that, that the U.S. is planning for now is the possibility of Mars sample return. And then a wide range of topics become available. From an orbital perspective, from a satellite perspective, you'd mainly look for the mineral associations. And, and you might also look for metabolic products coming out, which of course NASA has been doing for a couple of decades. You look for methane coming out. Um, if possible, get the isotopic signature of the methane because that can tell you whether or not there were biological catalyst enzymes involved in production of the methane. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was wonderful having you on the show. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net or thecosmiccompanion.com.